broadcasting live from LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. This is an episode you shouldn't be, miss out on. This is the 10th customer experience episode, and my feeling is this is going to be the best one of them all. What you will learn in this episode is that there are actually two belief systems when it comes to customer-led success. One works and the other doesn't. Stay tuned to find out which works, which can help you help your company, and which one doesn't, which will hurt your company, your profitability, and also your customers. The other thing you will learn amongst many is that 63% of senior executives believe in customer-led companies, but only 24 adopt a customer-centric approach. And we will find all about it when my guest comes on the show in just a little while. But let me introduce my guest. His name is Sean Mihan. He is the who is the Martin Hilty Professor of Marketing and Change Management at IMD Business School in Lausanne, Switzerland. He's an accomplished academic, instructor, consultant, and a thought leader working with companies across industries globally to grow capability and to create customer value in new and better ways. He has studied customer focus for over 25 years, what it is and how it contributes to superior performance, and hence the reason that he's here. He has authored two other important books, one titled Simply Better, Winning and Keeping Customers by Delivering What Matters Most and Beyond the Familiar, Long and the second one, Beyond the Familiar, Long-Term Growth Through Customer Focus and Innovation. He has been published in Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review, and received awards from the Marketing Science Institute, the Academy of Marketing, and the American Marketing Association. Having said that, let me welcome my guest, Sean Mihan. Sean, welcome to the Customer Experience Show. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to start by, by asking you the following. Your mm -hmm. other two books were all about customer focus and winning and keeping customers. Why are you such an ardent supporter of customer-led companies? Yeah, I, I suppose like a lot of people, you've got to, when you think about these things, you can go way back. So I have to just say I'm, I'm from a family business. I learned from my father, my mother, my aunt, my brother. Um, and I can tell you customers were an obsession and they remain an obsession in that business. Um, so learning all of that, studying at the College of Marketing with amazing professors, uh, I had this view that, you know, this is this is how you how you think about business and how you run a business. Well, there's no other way. Surely this is this is common sense. And then you get out in the real world and you realize there are other ways. And and I took a rather unusual route for somebody who's, who's interested in this stuff. I became an accountant. Not very <laughs> obvious uh, to me either, by the way. Um, but, but there you go. And I learned that, you know, our accounting firm was actually incredibly customer focused. Uh, and my friends who were working at Procter & Gamble, AC Nielsen, uh, Unilever, these big, big um, goliaths of, of marketing practice, we, we think, they actually never, ever came across customers. They, they, that wasn't part of their routine. They had data. They had a lot of tools and techniques. They had tools for everything. So on the one hand, I was looking at this relatively unstructured, um, incredibly responsive, totally tuned in, type of business and professional services. And I was contrasting it with this other amazing practitioners of tools and techniques. One void of tools and techniques, one with a lot of tools and techniques, one with an incredible focus and passion. The other, I don't think there was actually. So I set about thinking, why the heck was this, was this so? And which of these two worlds is correct? I wrote a PhD on the topic. I came to work at IMD Business School, and I've been uh, working with companies ever since on this topic. One of my colleagues early on said to me, you need to broaden your portfolio. I never broadened my portfolio. I've been busy every day since. There's a huge demand for what is this thing. I very simply put, and why I'm obsessed, if you like, uh, with this, uh, this, this sphere, is that Peter Drucker put it very, very plainly. So the purpose of a business is to create a customer without customers, without revenue, without, you know, a, a reason for being, why are you in business at all? And, and no business has any validity, market validity without customer, without a customer franchise. 
Um, so to me, this is so obvious, it is insane. And yet, the vast majority of companies are not run with that belief system. I totally agree with you. And the, if I may vouch for you, uh, you are our only guest who came onto the show 40 minutes before the show, which shows how conscientious you are. And conscientiousness is the fuel to customer service and customer respect. Uh, so thank you for that. Sure. Uh, let's go to a second question. You just written a new book, Customer Copernicus. Congratulations. You. Can you tell us uh, the central theme of the book and why is it called Copernicus? I think I, I, I believe I know, but I wanted to ask you. Sure, sure. Um, it, we try to answer two questions in our book. You know, there's an awful lot of books on customer centricity. And frankly, I think many of them are missing the point. I, I think because they, they don't go to this question of belief systems, they rather focus on tools and techniques. Um, so we, are, we asked ourselves, you know, why, why is it that something so obvious and so beneficial is still so rare? I mean, you can't meet an executive in the world who'll, who'll tell you that, that it, you know, customers are absolutely unimportant. They'll, they'll put it in some kind of a context. And as you saw from, from the survey results, which we'll talk about, you know, a lot of people will say it's one of the key drivers of business success, understanding your customers and doing something with that understanding. Well, if that's so, why is this so rare in fact? Because it is rare. Why, why is it so rare? Well, this is what this is what the book is about. Right? <laughs> about this belief system, which I, which I'll come to. But the second question we tried to answer, I think we did answer, is given that it's such a source of competitive advantage, given that you enjoy such fruits, you grow so well, you you have the a strong customer franchise, the the adulation of your customers, if you like, a fantastic relationship. Why do you give it up? Because they do. Customer-led success tends to last for some time. You know, Jeff Bezos is famous for uh, banging on about day one and keeping day one vitality. This is a customer-obsessed company. What he's talking about is having a, an outside-in view of the world from the, the definition of the purpose of that business the metrics that he uses to drive the business from day one and from day one where he told the market this is not about a short-term play this is not about quarterlies and i won't be paying dividends and i won't be making profits you know this is a bold bold step so for, for the clarity from that uh, from that position i think gives you a sense of there is a a belief system which is the answer to the question there is a belief system about not about customer centricity, which, which you mentioned in, in the introduction. The belief system is what is success in the company? What do you believe is success? And that's where we come to the difference between the knowing and doing, or the saying and doing gap. Lots of people will say customer centricity is important, but watch what they say, watch what they do within the company. What is the discourse within the company? What gets rewarded? What gets a pat on the back? And what we find is that there are two very different approaches in all companies. There are either, very broadly put, an efficiency-led approach or a customer-led approach. One of these is inside out. The other is outside in. I've given you the example of, of Amazon as outside in. An inside-out company is the most natural, the most natural of all perspectives. You sit in your office and you look out of the world. John Le Carrier once said, the desk is a very dangerous place from which to view the world. Amazing. That, is, that is correct, right? That is correct. <laughs> How many people try to run their empires, their companies from behind the desk? That is not the right frame of mind because you are overly influenced by those around you by their reference points. I mean, Michael, come on. The world of the executive and the world of the customer are two different worlds. The Very empathy true. gap is real. You have to take steps to overcome that empathy gap. 
totally agree. And if I may add, uh, in Jeff Bezos in meetings, he leaves an empty chair and he tells his executives uh, to just imagine that the customer is sitting there. So they mind their vocabulary, they think in terms of win-win. Uh, so yes, You know, it's excellent. interesting that, that yeah. a lot of companies will say, what, do, what would Jeff do? They use this as a metaphor. What would, what would Jeff do? Jeff never asked what would Jeff do. He asked what the customer would do. You just answer one or two of my other questions uh, about the outside in and inside out. Excellent. There is a statistic inside your book that says 63% of senior executives argue that understanding customer is critical to their organizational success, but yet only 24 adopt a customer-led approach. Uh, why is that? Uh, you've given us some clues, but can you give us some more? Yeah, we, we, um, we were studying the... Uh, we did a, a very large survey, global survey. We had 450 responses from senior executives around the world representing a broad range of industries. And we were looking at how to, how to codify their belief system, what they believe success uh, is. Um, and, and we looked at their behaviors because over, over many, many studies, you can see that understanding customers is actually easy. If you want to understand customers, it's not that difficult. One of the big beneficiaries of this customer uh, movement, which started in the early 1990s, I mean, I know that Drucker kicked off the idea in 54, but really it got, it got a lot of traction when the Marketing Science Institute got behind it with their initiatives back in, uh, in early 1990. Um, and since then, you have seen a dramatic rise in the acquisition of market research data in the number of customer focused change programs within organizations and the number of focus groups the number of discussions all of these have gone up and up and up there is no correlation whatsoever i can guarantee you there's no correlation between that rise in what i call customer sensing customer sensing yes bringing it in we have the information to business performance none absolutely none. none why well just think about any organization you know big idea comes in we should do this you know we have this idea from a customer and then you go about what would it take to get that done very difficult think about banks how difficult it is for them to do anything they might know what to do it's really difficult because of the systems they have to have in place, the regulation on those systems very changes slow. very slow. <clears throat> and they have old legacy systems, by the way, which mean that any little change at all takes months and months and months. And by the time you've done it, some fintech has come and stolen your, your, uh, your big idea anyway, because they're operating on totally different architectures. Um, so I think w what we know going into this is that responsiveness is, is not is is the weak link so we measured also uh, responsiveness and we were looking at their adaptiveness their adaptiveness to external um, uh, the willingness to adapt to external developments now when you look at all these three together you can get a sense of uh, when we did our structural equation modeling we could see that there's there's basically two approaches to running companies these days that are very prevalent and they all have some level of acknowledgement of just about everything, but the, the efficiency oriented ones are focused on lean. They're focused on things that they can control. They're focused on tweaking the machine. Customer led ones are absolutely not focused on that. They realize that being customer centric, if you like, is inconvenient. It's not obvious. It's unnatural. You have to push. Uh, against your own organization. That's why we say customer-led uh, leaders are committed, push against your own organization. They're assertive. They're asserting their ideas within the marketplace. Think about all these breakthroughs. For example, Uber, Airbnb, these, these, uh, these category-changing companies. They have to fight regulators. They have to fight unions. They have to fight accepted norms. And nobody, these, these aren't good guys. These aren't nice people. 
it takes a lot <laughs> of energy and a lot of determination and a willingness to be unpopular to actually make that work. So a lot of strength and energy. But what's defining about them is that they are externally focused. They're doing it because this makes sense for our customer. It's outside the right in. thing outside in. It's the right thing for our customer. So you design from the outside in. And for, I mentioned banks. The bank that has made this work is DBS Singapore, the uh, world's best digital bank. <clears throat> it went from a legacy system to a designed, redesigned their bank from the outside in. The chairman said, blow it up. Blow up the existing the existing system. That was, huge. That was incredible support that was required from the top to enable the level of changes that need to happen within the organization. And this has been a 10-year journey for them so far, uh, longer than a 10-year journey for them. And, and, and it works. These guys are hugely competitive with fintechs and tech fins. Excellent. Sean, may I ask something? You talked about banks, and these are the big guys. Uh, not easy to navigate. How about the smaller guys, uh, family businesses? Is that easier for a smaller company to make the change, to sense the data and make the change the smaller the company is? Um, maybe. Maybe. I, I, I attended a, a fantastic presentation by the CEO of the world's biggest health um, pet care company. I wanted to call it correctly. Not pet, not pet food company. They're gone beyond pet food. They don't sell food to, to people who own dogs and cats and so on. They, they make them the look good. Of, they are in the business of pet care, whatever makes the world, yeah. they're, they're the pets' lives better. And I thought that was an amazing, uh, ama an amazing perspective that, you know, you need to, and, and he said something that, that answers, that addresses your question. P.E., PE is not the friend of customer centricity. PE is is whatever it is, and he had very he had some strong words about that, and that's uh, and that's and that's fine. But I, I come to the view that short termism is is very it's very very difficult in a short term with a short term horizon to really be customer centric. On the one hand, there's a bit of a of a um, dichotomy here. On the one hand, you have small businesses. Who need to feed their employees? I mean, you need to bring home the bacon. So that's a kind of an internal uh, pull. But actually, you don't need that pressure because you, you the owner or the, the, the key people driving the business, tend to have visibility and exposure to real customers. They get you on the phone. They tell you in no uncertain uh, terms what is right and what is wrong and what they would like changed for their benefit. Now, there's a risk here, too. Because if you respond to just about everything that they ask you for, believe me, you will end up with nothing. They will end up with everything. That's just human nature. Why would they stop asking if you keep saying yes? So you do have to be absolutely clear on what exactly is your value proposition and what is it not? What's outside of that realm? And do what you do extraordinarily well. In the first book, Simply Better, that was, that was what we were saying. Be better than everybody else in your category. Be the obvious choice. Focus on that. Don't try to be something else. So in small businesses, you have this natural uh, proximity to clients, which keep you very focused on your customers, your market. But as you grow, you are going to be, uh, you're going to have some, some pressures. The organization is going to become more complex. There, you are going to raise funds for expansion, which you have to do. You will then need to, um, be beholden to those fund holders, you, you, to those uh, lenders. You need to pay them back. You need to, you need to tell them uh, what your profitability numbers are. You need to make, meet the, uh, the commitments of the loan. So, you know, um, there will be pressures that just literally take your minutes, the minutes available to you, to be inside out, not outside in. And that is the slippery slope. And as you expand, you hire people from outside, for example. You know, you have internal pressures, you have external pressures, and you have new competitors coming out of nowhere. And that's the sort of stuff that di di distracts you. What Bezos was saying was this day one thing. He's talking about a concept that we call burningness. Burningness comes from three places, one of three places, or maybe more than one. 
pain, fear, or ambition. Without one of those, you, it's really hard to change an existing inside-out belief system to an outside-in belief system. Pain is the most immediate. You've got to. The status quo is untenable. Fear, it might become untenable. So it's a little bit less hard to get the people internal moving. Ambition is an interesting one. Um, in theory, you could say it's the most <laughs> difficult because people are happy with the way things are. But you've got to paint a picture of a world in which you wouldn't be happy. So you bring them to, but, but by doing X, Y, and Z, we will have a tremendous business. We'll be doing something amazing for our, uh, for our customers. Let's be, let's be that company. Uh, and you've got to give people the tools and techniques uh, in order to get there. But then you've got to give them the belief because you're changing from hit the numbers, make the sales numbers, make the profitability numbers, make the cost numbers, you're, you're, that's how people understood success. That's how they thought they get rewarded in an organization. You've got to change that whole discourse to creating customer value, to being outside in. So you need to give them a reason that you're not just saying it, that it's actually real. We call this a moment of belief. Moment of belief. This is the moment where you did something, you invested ahead of the market research that told you what the return would be because it was the right thing to do for the customer. So maybe this is where Tesco comes in on a call we had together. You met, you talked about Tesco and guys, please do send your questions in if you like uh, for Sean. Uh, we will get to one or two questions uh, after, the, after we finish with Sean. We have another two questions to ask Sean. So can you tell us, Sean, about Tesco since you mentioned it just now? Because on our first phone call, you told me a, a brilliant example about Tesco. I love, the, I love Tesco. I have to say I'm, I'm a huge admirer of them over many, many years. Um, and, and one of the interesting things we featured in the book for a key reason, it was an exemplar which lost it. Uh, so it has the full cycle from not being, um, being inside out to being outside in to losing it. And, and I told you a story about their uh, Tesco one in front. Uh, so this was an initiative where back in, in the early uh, 90s, I think it was, they, um, they decided, let us, one of the things, they did a lot of market research, and this is now the question of responsiveness. They found, they understood that one of the pain points for a, cons a, a shopper was standing in line queuing to leave you know with their basket oh gosh how many people ahead of me is that basket big or small you know scanning the, the line and they i said, feel the same thing every time i go to the supermarket still today 2021 yes <laughs> and then and then you ask yourself you know um what, what is it what is it i really want well i want to just walk up to somebody who's ready to cash me out so what they said was if there is a line that is available uh, i mean not manned then we will we will man it. Uh, so as soon as there is two people in front, that if you're the second person in front, they will open another line. So there should only be one person in front of you in the line. Now the cost of implementing that initiative was sixty million in the early nineties at a time when there. So that was more than ten percent of their profits at the time. At the time in, in the nineties. Yeah. So to implement this across all of their. Uh, all of their stores in the UK was a really big deal. Now, the market research couldn't tell you that this was going to be good. Don't forget, it's not like these guys are going to buy more. They're on their way out of the shop. Now, maybe your brand will improve and maybe it'll enhance the chance they come back, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't know that. It's so not you, a safe bet. It's, you're going to, you, you're doing it because you believe it makes sense, right? And when you start to make those sort of investments, people realize, ah, oh, there's they're serious about this. When they did the uh, the club card, when they did Tesco.com, it was the same thing. Don't don't forget when they did Tesco.com, which was one of the first cool you know internet retailers of, of uh, food food delivery um, uh, stores. They there was uh, very few homes at that moment had a computer. And the computers they had weren't that fast. This was a move ahead of its time. Now it's just normal. Why wouldn't you have this? They were, they were one of the very first in the world to do this at a colossal cost. 
and no obvious immediate return. When they went into their ethnic food line, you know, it, it was to serve an unserved market. It wasn't because it was going to be hugely profitable, but you know, it became hugely profitable when the people who weren't the ethnic minorities started to buy those, uh, those brands, those lines in their droves. So it became a very interesting thing. Doing the right thing for the customer, we see over time again and again, it delivers great results in the long term. No question. Great, great. One last question, Sean. We want, I want to ask you about uh, executives from smaller companies that they're <laughs> trying to make ends meet during these difficult times. What advice would you give to these executives, managers, owners uh, to implement customer-led uh, philosophies and to help them out? You know, right now, uh, I think one of the owners, of course, are trying to stay alive. They're, they're trying to keep their businesses alive. This is a dreadful experience that, that everyone's going through. What they need to understand, I'm sure, they need to be optimistic. Um, the pandemic is not going to last forever. Uh, customer needs, however, are enduring. What we need, to, what they need to make sure is preference for their business, for their services, for their brands, are also enduring. So they need to. One of the the three critical elements of a successful brand over time is awareness, relevance, and trust. They need to not go off the radar. I would urge them to stay in front of your customers, call your customers, talk to your customers, visit them when it's possible. When that becomes possible again, open your doors, be visible. Um, relevance. You need, you need to have something to say that is relevant or a response that is relevant to the life that your customer is living now because they're not living the same life that they were living 18 months ago. They have needs that they didn't have then. They have new needs, which will go away. But they need to understand that you are being responsive to their specific situation within the context of your brand, within the relevance of your brand. So awareness, relevance, and trust. You need to, it is, it is so true that everyone wants to do business with someone they like, and someone they trust. Now, if you let me down at this moment, when I'm in this, in this situation, forget it. All bets are off. If you let your customers down now, the cost of getting back to where you were before, I think is probably insurmountable. You need to stay in the game. Be optimistic. This is going to turn around. Excellent reply. Amazing. Um, we're going to get only to one question because we've run out of time uh, and we're going to get to it in a little while. But Sean, I have to tell you, uh, you uh, the information you have delivered here is, has blown my mind and I have a feeling that it has done the same for our followers and friends. So thank you for this. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, Melissa, can we have, uh, let's take only one question, please, uh, because I want to recap and uh, because we're past the time. That's very interesting. Uh, the question comes from Sofia Shilimintri. She's the person who introduced us to Sean, and we owe her a lot. Thanks, Sofia. Uh, what is the main driver of responsiveness in organizations? Having a healthy budget or an enthusiastic leader that is willing to experiment? I think both. I, I don't think that these are different worlds, Sophia. Um, I think what is really important is that you do not try to do what you cannot afford to do. You have to live within your means, but you also have to be willing to, to invest. It's, to, it's totally clear. And if you're looking for the cost benefit analysis of these, uh, of these, in these decisions, that's, that is not necessarily putting the customer first. You have to run a responsible business clearly. You can't respond to every request of every customer. Responsiveness isn't, isn't being a bellhop, a cosmic bellhop. Responsiveness is doing the right thing in relation to the information that you are receiving and only that information that you are receiving that's relevant for uh, your brand and the development of your brand. Very quickly, I'll just cite Tide. Tide washes cleanest, 1948. 2000 and uh, 2000 and where are we? 21. Tide washes cleanest. 
it's still the the brand equity that they trade on but it has changed again and again it has been responsive again and again and it has been it's been able to afford to be responsive because it's a very healthy brand franchise a great reply um so my dear friends and fans if you want to send in your questions because i see questions coming in i'll send them to shan and uh, if he's so kind he can answer them uh in conclusion let me say that uh, we learned today from shan that the most dangerous place to be is your desk when it comes to customer service you need to get out there in the market and uh, the pandemic has caused us to stay inside so we need to move outside so we have a view from the outside in uh, another thing that we've learned today is what would jeff do uh, citing jeff bezos asked the question because uh, jeff bezos has always been an ardent supporter of uh, outside in organizations uh, if you take care of your customer your customer will take care of you uh, we talked about tesco experimenting when nothing was uh, a safe bet but it worked out fantastically well because they wanted to service their customers uh, in order not to wait for a long time when they were checking out. At the end of the day, the biggest lesson I learned uh, from my friend uh, Sean was that you should be very conscientious, arrive 40 minutes earlier, even before the host on this show, and that's how, that has taught me a great lesson. Thank you very much, Sean. It's a pleasure and honor having you here, and thank you to IMD also. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All the best.